Welcome to the Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. I'm your host, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today, we have Tate Seamer, founder of Greenlight Equity Group and host of the Apartment Guys podcast. Welcome, Tate. George, is awesome to be here. I am super excited for this. Great. And why don't you start our audience off with giving us a little bit about who is Tate Seamer? Yeah, so Tate Seamer is, um, I, I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I moved uh, after college. Uh, I, I got a degree in psychology in, um, in Ohio, Ohio University, and after college moved to Utah to ski and in 1999 and never left so um i yeah that that makes me 48 years old for those of you that are wondering doing the math in your head i i was 26 when i moved out here and um and just love utah love the lifestyle out here and uh, i'm a big skier and mountain biker and i go camping all the time and um, i have great friends and we kind of tear it up we work hard and play hard but um, real estate wise, I, uh, I'm originally a photographer, a formal wedding and portrait photographer by trade and did, did a lot of ski photography as well and uh, got into real estate in 2006 when I kind of discovered that photography as hard as I w could work wasn't going to afford the lifestyle that I really wanted for myself. And uh, so got into real estate and just took a real basic single family home flipping class and learned the, the basics, the nuts and bolts of, of the single family world and a little bit about multifamily, but small multifamily like duplexes and fourplexes and uh, got into real estate in terms of being a realtor. I got my license and worked with uh, investors and flipped houses myself. And then in, the crash happened in 08 and I was kind of not, I, I hadn't really found my groove in single family and uh, was, wasn't really loving things as far as that went and was kind of burnt out anyway. So when the crash happened, I went back to photography for a while. And then uh, my longtime business partner and best friend, and uh, he, he in, in 2011 approached me and said, you know, would you be interested in flipping houses again? And I said, dude, no way. I'll never do anything related to real estate ever again. And, uh, and then, you know, a few months later, we're making an offer on a house and flipping it. And so needless to say, I was able to, uh, I, I was, I, I, my mindset came around to getting back into real estate and, and, and we did the flip, the single family flipping game hard and heavy for uh, about six years, maybe seven years or so. And, uh, did, moderately well with it, right? Like what we kept running into is scalability and how hard it is to do volume in flipping. And when you're flipping and not holding on to things, you're not growing wealth. And uh, so one, one takeaway for your listeners right off the bat would be hold on to as much real estate as you can, no matter what kind of real estate it is, uh, hold on to it whenever, whenever you can, however you can, um, you're never going to be sorry that you did that. So, um, basically about four years ago, we went from being a, being in the mentality of flipping houses and we were doing million dollar houses and, and duplexes and stuff like that. So we, we were trying to do bigger and bigger stuff. And I started going to a local RIA event. Uh, a, a real estate investor association uh, here in Utah and um, went to a meeting that a, a young developer uh, was presenting at. And uh, we, we basically were very impressed with, with him and his projects. And he was building small townhome developments around downtown Salt Lake City. And we ended up, long story short, buying two projects from him um, that were land, basically vacant lots that had building permits for them. And we put on our developer hat, which we had never worn before, and our builder hat, which 
well, we weren't builders. We hired a builder. Um, and, and, um, that actually turned out to be a fatal mistake, um, uh, in, in terms of the success of those deals. Um, right out of the gate, we hired the wrong firm to, to build these, these products for us. And before we knew it, they were sideways and they were just kind of slim deals to begin with. And they ended up not going very well. Um, we also did a number of land entitlement deals in the meantime, where we were buying raw land and entitling them for higher density townhome projects. Uh, and, um, and, and those were successful. We did well with those. Um, and then we had a 12 unit come along. So I'll stop there because that, that's when we kind of get into apartments. Um, do, you, do you have any questions, George? Any Anything you want to run by me out of that so far? Absolutely. So I think it's fascinating that you've done really both sides of the development. You've you've been in essentially the ground up development. You also focused on just doing the entitlements, sort of the front end and getting things prepared to pass off to somebody. So in in the future, which which do you prefer? And maybe you can compare and contrast how yeah. long it takes to get in and out and uh, the amount of upside that you can expect for those two different approaches. Well, I'll tell you that we are we're actually really not doing either one of those moving forward in our own business model right now. Um, <clears throat> between the two, I think the land entitlement deals are are less risky because there's a lot less moving parts. Once you break ground on a deal on a on a project, you're literally throwing about you know a few hundred balls into the air and if you don't have the right juggler, meaning your builder, um, if you don't have the right person pulling the strings and keeping all the balls in the air and, and being ahead of the project by six months and scheduling and everything else, you're going to, it's, it's, there's a lot of risk in that. And, you know, if you're doing it yourself, if you're a builder and a developer and you're, you're doing it yourself, you can mitigate a lot of that risk, obviously. But, uh, it's there's still a, a construction risk is a very real thing. Um, things like material prices, right? We've seen tons of volatility in the materials uh, recently. Um, markets can shift in the course of a year that or year and a half or two years that it takes to build something. So you're always a couple years out when you're underwriting on a building project. And basically, you know, what happened for us was we had a whole, we had the same developer actually, um, that we brought, we bought the townhome projects from, but he brought us a 12 unit, uh, class C minus distressed, very distressed, uh, property in here in South Salt Lake city. And this was in uh, 2018 and basically said, you know, this is a really good deal guys. You should, you should do it. Here's why here's how. Um, this is how I would structure it. This is how I'd finance it. And we ended up buying it and it was mind blowing for us. Like it was a huge revelation for us when we sat down and underwrote that deal and, and analyzed it. I remember Carl, my partner looking at me and saying, can you shoot any holes in this deal? And I was like, dude, this is amazing because this is a cash flowing property that's profitable that has, uh, you know, in, in this case, it didn't, we didn't have great financials because the, the property was being self-managed and they just didn't, they weren't very careful. And it was about half vacant. The, the other six units were hardly paying anything for rent. Um, so we just, we went in there and essentially whitewashed the place as far as like just a complete overhaul, top to bottom, uh, TPO membrane roof, eco-friendly windows, LVT floors, central air. We, we really did like solid surface, stainless, uh, you know, all the nice finishes and we're able to double rents and got a great equity position on that place and, and ended up selling it. We needed, we needed the income because of what was going on with the townhomes and, uh, and, and did very well. We made about 300,000 in about a year on that project. Um, even though we went, over on our budget and uh, you know long uh, like side note on that is had we kept it because we sold it in 2019 our market here has appreciated so incredibly much 
that we would have done very, very well uh, had we kept the project. Um, and and it'd be cash flowing nicely and the whole nine yards. Um, so, you know, it's always one of the big takeaways so far in my career has been um, just keeping stuff like however you can keeping it. So, um, so that's how that was our really our foray into the, the apartment world. And um, we've since done a 20 unit here in Utah, and then we've done 552 units between Oklahoma City and Columbus. And that's really our model now moving forward is larger scale apartment communities in those two markets, Oklahoma City and Columbus, Ohio, uh, that we know very well. We know uh, our infrastructure very well there. We've got good property management there, good, good um, contractors, resources, um, investors, lenders, et cetera, attorneys. So we're set up very well in those markets and we've got enough deal flow coming from both of those markets now that we really just look at those. So um, obviously there's been a lot that's happened between the 20 unit and today where we are today. And, and I can speak to kind of what I think was important about the progression there and how we how we ended up doing over 500 units in 2021. Um, I think I can, I, I think I can like shed some light into what it took to get there. If that makes sense to you. That would be awesome. And before you do that, why don't you just yeah. bring us along in the timeline? I believe that all of these acquisitions are in the last 18 months or so. Yeah. I mean, literally as of July of 2020, we had, not only did we not have any, rental units on our books, but we actually had these losses um, going into the beginning of the year uh, in that we still own these, uh, well, three out of the six of these properties that we were building. And so we were in a hole. We were in a pretty deep hole, actually. And long story short on those development projects, we got our butts kicked. It, we went big wave surfing and got pummeled in the surf, man. We got um, I, I, all I can say is it was a two and a half year slow motion train wreck where we knew six, eight months into it, that things weren't going to go very well at the end and they didn't go very well at the end. It, it was very, very challenging, very difficult and going to work every day, uh, working as hard as you could, knowing that at the end of the day, you were going to lose money was a, a tough, tough place to be in. And it took a long time to get out of them. So really what it took for me was, was like using all of the mindset chops that I had and could develop at the time. So what I mean by that is I, I really focused on faith and I, I don't mean that in any religious sense of the word necessarily. Um, although it could certainly mean that for, for, for you, the listener, but, uh, for me, I, I really latched on to Hal Elrod's book, the miracle equation and his, the miracle equation is simply, uh, unwavering faith plus extraordinary effort equals miracles. And I had a choice like every day as to what story I was going to live from as to why it, what was going on with these townhomes. And the story that I chose was that I don't know how it's going to work out, but somehow it's going to work out and somehow it's going to make me better and make us better. And I just ran with that. And I literally lived that. Like I, I embodied it as much as I could every single day. And I just kept our, ship headed in the right direction in that we got involved with some, um, in a specific coaching mastermind with a, a apartment guru named Corey Peterson. And he gave us a lot of confidence and a lot of education about going after larger apartments. And we really set our sights on the model that we're in now, which is cash flowing, um, cash flowing apartment communities, 
with some value add that are in high growth markets or, or nice growth, like steady growth markets. Um, and that's really like, we've really lived into becoming a syndication team where we've got a, a good capital raising game at this point, we've got good deal flow and we're at, we're good asset managers. Um, we're learning every day. Like we're, we're still obviously new that these, we bought six communities in 2021 and, uh, the totaling that 552 doors and, 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 you know, when you do something like that, every deal is different. And, uh, you learn, you learn every day when you're doing that many deals at once. Um, you are learning about legal stuff and capital raising stuff. And it, it's just, it's a, it's a process and it's, you know, if it's fun for you, which it is for me, I love it. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a ride. It's really a fun ride. Um, so I feel like we've really hit our stride. Like we've, we've morphed and kind of, tra you know, transformed the business and our company into, we gave the company a new name. Uh, we, we were, we were Olympus development for the longest time. And, uh, three, three and a half years ago, rebranded as green light. And, uh, so I, you know, I personally feel like we're, things are just getting better and better. It's like, there's this phrase, the better it gets, the better it gets, which I love. And I feel like that's happening for us. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm going to all kinds of conferences. Like, you know, you and I got to meet in person, George, and, and getting to hang out with you and your team. Like I just get off on that sort of thing, man. It's, it's super fun. And, and this is a, a, a space that attracts really high level people. And it's a space that's conducive to personal growth and development and professional development. And, so I get to really work on myself and become a better version of me as our portfolio grows. And as we get to positively affect the lives of literally hundreds and hundreds of people directly uh, who are our residents um, that we care a lot about and care about their safety and health and well-being, and our investors as well. So we're just kind of constantly in service of those two groups of people and we feel like if we focus there that everything else will kind of fall into place. I love that. And uh, you did talk a little about why you picked your markets. <laughs> You're mainly focused now on Columbus, Ohio and Oklahoma city. Tell us about Columbus first. Is that something you would consider a steady growth market and what sort of growth are you seeing around there? Um, it is a steady growth market. And what we're seeing around there is something similar to a lot of kind of hot markets that have some hype to them, which is like single family houses are going on the market and they're literally going under contract in three days with, you know, 10, 20, 30 offers, multiple offers on the place, often for over the asking price. Um, you're seeing that in a lot of markets, Salt Lake City's like that right now. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of others that, um, that are just high demand and low inventory in the single family world. And they, uh, this market also has a fairly nice inventory of larger scale, uh, apartment communities. So there's a fair amount of product for us to go after. Um, there's a, it's a product class that is under high demand, like we've, our, pro, our current projects, they're class C and the, the rents are about as in both cases are, um, well, we've got three now, but in, in all three cases actually are as the rents are as low as anything else in the community. And actually in some cases are lower than anything else in the immediate area. So we know that, you know, a, a two bedroom apartment in, uh, Columbus in central Columbus, that's renting for six seventy five. you know, when it's fixed up should be renting for nine or nine fifty, And, um, and, and so there's a lot of that there. So it's, it's just an, ex, it's an exciting market. That's got a, a great, uh, like economic and employment base. It, it's got 
the third largest university in the country in Ohio State. Uh, it's the state capital, so it's got all that infrastructure. Uh, got a lot of like good hospitals and Fortune 500 companies headquartered there. Great um, logistics and distribution hubs uh, are in Central Ohio. So uh, professional sports and music and culture and great schools. Um, so we, there's just a lot to low unemployment, great gross household median income is really good, especially in certain areas. Um, so, and Oklahoma City is similar. Um, it's not quite as uh, hot, I, I don't think, but it's a bigger animal and it's got much more inventory. So there's a lot of class C value add in, in Oklahoma City. And we don't want to stay with class C value add necessarily forever, but for us, what it it's given us the opportunity to work really hard and do a good job with these projects and create a lot of value and a lot of upside. And it's really there, you know, it's kind of jump starting our balance sheet to, to do a lot of these he heavier value add, not super heavy lift, but they're usually heavy management plays, quite frankly, is what we're really dealing with right now. Well, I'd really like to call out uh, the good things you have to say about the Midwest, or at least certain areas in the Midwest. I'm also a Midwesterner, still in the Midwest. I live in Southeast Michigan. And I know a lot of people in my area, they get this idea like, hey, you know, if I'm going to invest in multifamily, well, you know, hey, I'm going to go down to Orlando or Atlanta, or, uh, you know, maybe going to go to Central Tennessee. But guess what? There are areas within the Midwest that are growing like crazy. Like, for example, in Michigan, if you take a look at Ottawa County, uh, Kent County, this is out in the West, there's a swath across our state that is still growing, despite the fact that two thirds of our counties are not. Columbus, great story behind it. And I just uh, love to hear people looking a little deeper uh, let's see, what's another one? I want to say uh, Indianapolis is another one that I hear a lot about. Yep. Have, you, have you looked out there? We haven't looked at projects specific in Indianapolis, but it's similar to Columbus. It's And it's not that it's two, three hours away from Columbus, I believe. Yeah. And uh, and it's kind of, you know, it's it's got all these highways that intersect there in the middle of, it's kind of like Columbus in that way. And it, it's the state capital. Uh, it, it's hot. You know, another one is Louisville, which is close by. Uh, that's a good, good little market, man. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening there. Um, I'm not real. I'm from Cincinnati and I'm, and you know, I'm a big Reds fan and not so much Bengals, but, um, you know, I, I, I am not real hot on Cincinnati. I think it's actually, I think it's a good place to be for the long term for sure. And I think it's a it's one of it's a slower but steady market and it's gonna keep doing well. But it doesn't Cle Cleveland and Cincinnati just don't have this hype and vibe and kind of like I don't know, I'm not sure what they're like zest, like people just love living in Columbus and they're proud of Columbus and and you don't really get that as much in Cincinnati and Cleveland, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, it, look, these are all healthy economy. Pittsburgh's another one that's close by that's a, a healthy economy. Um, I don't know the landlord laws in Pennsylvania as well. So I don't know if it's as landlord friendly, but, um, but yeah, I, I think you're right. And, and look, everybody's hot on the Southeast, right? Because well, let's everybody's, I mean, people want to move there. And so lots of people are moving there. And so there's a lot of population growth and, and that's great. And there's good deals to be had there. And, it, but it is very competitive. Um, and, you know, we, as we've grown and, and gotten our presence, our feet on the ground in these two markets, I feel like we've got a pretty good competitive advantage in here. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, I guess it's like practicing one instrument, you get decent at it and, you know, say guitar or whatever. And it's like, you want to kind of keep playing guitar as opposed to like going and starting at square one with piano again. Right. Like you just want to get better and better at guitar. That makes sense. And that's kind of how I feel about these markets. It's like, I want to get to know these markets better and better and better and get to know the owners and the big players and, the big brokers and, and, and be the first 
person that a lot of these guys will call and gals will call if we have, if they have deals. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we are at, at this point. We had a deal come up in uh, San Antonio yesterday, uh, came across my desk and that's a market I've been to. Uh, we shopped in, we, we wrote LOIs in, in the past, but I'm just not as inclined to, to go there now that we're, are, that we're really immersed in these other two. It makes perfect sense. And I love a lot of those markets you just mentioned. Got some things going on now in Louisville, Kentucky, the gateway to the Midwest, uh, thanks mm -hmm. to some great partners I know out there. Something just closed yesterday. Cool. And got to say, I love it. But you're right. You got to focus and you've got two fabulous markets that you're focusing on. Uh, why don't we talk about your best acquisition story? I know a lot of these can be really long and winding roads. And I think that there's usually a lot of uh, insight that comes out of uh, taking something, say, from uh, soup to nuts, how you yeah. found the deal and uh, how'd you close it and, and tell us about the roller coaster in between. Yeah. And there always is one, right? Especially on your first few deals, there's, it's a roller coaster. Um, but the, I, I'll say our 20 unit here in Utah was hands down our best and most important acquisition. And the reason I say that is because the context that that deal arose out of, it's, it's almost like the Phoenix rising from the ashes. Like we, we were in dire, dire straits when that deal came along and we, so, and it came along because of the townhome project. So we, at one point we were trying to sell the townhomes midstream and just to get out of them to an investor, or whoever might buy them. And a, a realtor came through and brought an, brought a client through and I, he and I got to talking and, and I said, you know, we're really focusing on, on apartments now on multifamily. And if you, if you know of anything, if you see anything, let me know. And he said, as a matter of fact, we have a 20 unit that uh, was just under contract. It's coming out of contract and uh, we're about to put it back on the market. So if you want to take a look at it and uh, take a crack at it, you're welcome to. And so we did, and we were under, um, uh, we were in a very competitive situation and meaning there were other offers on the table. Uh, one of the best things that we did ever was, I went out and invited uh, a colleague uh, of, of ours who owned about, at the time, about $95 million worth of apartments around Salt Lake and didn't have partners. And uh, had, so was therefore had heavy net worth, heavy liquidity and heavy level of experience. We asked him to be on this deal with us just as an advisor for 5% of the deal. And that morphed a little bit. We needed a little bit of, of capital and he brought some of that and it is more of a partner than just the 5%. And we've since done, I think, five deals with him as our KP, as our sponsor. This, that's how I developed our KP relationship was off, basically offering him part of a deal um, for free and not free, but like for to be an advisor, essentially. Um, and we've got a, a terrific friendship and uh, uh, just a good, solid, uh, exciting business relationship moving forward. He's very pro growth and, and loves doing deals and wants to do more and more and more. And that's where we are too. Um, so, so basically we, this, now th keep in mind, this is an asset that is at the, at the time, severely distressed. So we've got, uh, the roof was like, okay, but not, not great. Um, the mechanicals were all very old, um, at furnaces, uh, and they had swamp coolers out here in the desert. We have these swamp coolers, which are like evaporative coolers that replace your air conditioning and basically are plumbed to the ceiling. So you've got water lines up on top of your ceiling on top of your roof and stuff. So they're not ideal. So we, um, ended up taking those out and putting central air in, but, um, they needed everything. They were just they, quite frankly, they were pretty disgusting. 
and smelled horrible and were greasy and just as a whole, it was a very, very dirty building and really needed everything. We, it, the only thing it didn't really need is windows, but we did everything else. So, um, so this, and, and we ended up buying it for two point, uh, uh, let's see, 2.25 million was our purchase price on it. Um, so, you know, a little over a hundred thousand a unit in Utah, that's a steal. We knew that we could go in and, uh, and, and improve the place drastically with enough CapEx and, um, and, and had enough upside in the rents as a result of that. So we ended up, um, winning the deal. Um, I think providing proof of funds was a huge part of that. We were able to do that with our, our partner and we, you know, of course we're pre-approved for the loan and everything else. We ended up getting a, uh, essentially a bridge loan construction loan that paid for uh, CapEx on the project. And we thought we were going to put about a half million into the project, but we ended up putting uh, about 800, 850 into the project. However, we were able to increase rents by about $200 more than we wrote underwrote pro forma. So we were able to take rents that were averaging probably 675, 700 uh, to 1350. So we literally almost doubled rents and, and really increased the value of the building therefore. But we, you know, we spent on a 20 unit, we spent 40 something, 45,000 a unit. A lot of that was exterior and general common area stuff. Um, interesting side note on this deal it had a piece of land attached to it that was vacant and we subdivided that piece off and had it entitled for townhomes and sold it to a developer and essentially did a land entitlement deal out of that and made, um, made like I, somewhere around 700,000 on that deal, just as a side note on the apartment. So me in the meantime, the apartment building, uh, now we're about to list it for 4.4 million. Uh, so we've nearly doubled the value of the building we think. And, uh, but we're probably going to wait till the spring to dispose, um, at this point, cause we think it'll show a lot better then. So anyway, that's, that is like, at the end of the day, it's a seven figure profit just on the repositioning. Um, not, you know, not to mention the, uh, the, the land deal and think about how clutch that deal is for us and was for us coming out of the hole that we were in and where we would be if we weren't, if we didn't do that deal, it absolutely saved us. And for me, it's, it was a product of being like being really, again, being faithful that something good was going to happen. I didn't know what it was or what it would look like, but uh, have, having this, having this deal, you know, having it be successful, uh, has, it has kept us alive and kept us, uh, you know, at a level that we can continue to grow and thrive as a company and is also going to essentially dig us out of the hole that the, the townhome projects left us in and will basically wipe the slate clean and, and, you know, save the day. So it was a massive, massive deal for us. Awesome story of redemption. And I understand that is about to go full cycle, but you do have one deal that just in the last 18 months has already gone full cycle. Tell us a little bit about that one. Well, that was actually, um, so the, the one that's gone full cycle in the 18 months is this 20 unit we, uh, the, with a 12 unit went full cycle uh, two years ago, two basically. years ago. Okay. I see. Yeah. So, and it, you know, it when it, it, and it was full cycle in that we did a full repositioning and, uh, raised rents a lot and just changed the, the asset a ton. Um, so, but look, we, we just started in, in March, we acquired our first 179 units in Mansfield, Ohio, north of Columbus. And 
shortly thereafter acquired 70 more units in central Columbus. And, uh, and then we've required a 51 unit in Oklahoma City, 192 units in Oklahoma City. Um, and we're working on a few more projects out there right now. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting one. <laughs> um, I, I know I'm forgetting one. I can't, I just can't think of which one it is. But um, like we were able to, I think the most important thing is we didn't sit and rest at our 20 unit mentality. We really kept pushing our, our mindset and our goals to towards the, the, the much larger unit count. So we set a goal to be at 500 units this year and, um, and we got there. So, you know, if, if we had set a goal to keep doing 20 unit projects, we maybe would have said, let's do 80 this year. And, and yeah, we could probably pull those deals off and bring in less partners and maybe make more per deal. And that's a real consideration, right? But, uh, we're, we're looking, we're really trying to make a splash right now and, and, um, and do good, really good things in the, in the, in the markets that we're in. Um, so it's really for us, the bigger, the better we've, we kind of joke, uh, between Chelsea Garber, my, one of my two partners yeah. and Carl and myself, we joke uh, all the time about going big or going bigger. You know, it's <laughs> like, that's kind of our philosophy. I love that. And so apart from this idea of having faith, and that's what really carried you through these difficult times, uh, anything else that inspires you, any inspiring words, inspiring quotes that you have for other entrepreneurs? Yeah, tons, man. I, there's, there's so much. I'm, I'm really, a, I'm a huge believer in this mindset piece. I think it really is like, uh, it underlies it, everything that you do everything else that you do in, in your business. It, and it, it's your re, the reality that you're experiencing in your, in your business right now is a result of your mentality and your mindset. I'm, I really believe that. So I, I think whatever you can do to work on that piece and, and take charge of that piece and really be the master of your own inner domain, um, the better. So, um, as far as quotes, you know, I've got a quote on our, on our, um, on our door to our office that I'm looking at right now. It says, it's quite possible things will turn out far better than you can imagine. And, uh, I don't know who said that, but I just, I love that. I love language that speaks to possibility and creates space for great things to happen. And so far, like that's, that reality has happened. Like I didn't think we're, you know, we're, we're trying, we're really going to try to get to a thousand doors by the end of this year, at least under contract. So like, I'd like to get two more communities going before the close of this year, at least. Um, and yeah, you know, like that's way better than I would have imagined three, four or five years ago. Like we're, you know, we're somewhere around 38, $39 million in assets under management right now. And that would have been inconceivable to me like even two and a half years ago. Awesome. So. so I hate to say that all good things must come to an end, but it looks like we're coming on about 45 minutes and have to let you go to, uh, to your quest to get to a thousand units this year. Let me, let me, if I it. could, if, if, George, if I could, yeah, do we have sure. another minute or two? Sure. If, yeah. Hit us. Okay. I, I wanted to mention this book. I'm holding it up right now. It's called vivid vision. Uh, by Cameron Harold. Are you familiar with this, George? I, I think I might be, um, or maybe I've seen another book that seems to have a similar, who's the forward by? Um, I think it's Stephen Covey. Oh, okay. Okay. That's a different uh, book than the one I was thinking of. But no, there's actually awesome. no forward. No forward. No forward. Okay. Yeah. All right. Tell us. What this is, just real quick. This is like a how to, it's a quick read it's a how-to book on how to create your vivid vision for you and for your business. And what your vivid vision is, is it's a three-year vision that's like your mission statement and your vision statement on steroids. So it's like a five to six page document that you end up with that covers all the aspects of your business, what, it's, what they're doing, uh, how, how they're thriving, what, 
basically if things go the way that you would want them to go at their very best, what does that three-year vision look like? And you create this um, document that you then end up having in your arsenal to share with brokers and lenders and investors and colleagues like George and people that you're talking to. And it really, it creates this, this excitement and uh, this, this just, it, it, it creates um, something that people can connect to, right? That, and it, and it uh, is much larger than you at the end of the day. And it's so much larger than you would say, than you can say in a mission statement or the Cameron Harold, the author, he says, basically, basically mission statements are dead. They're just, they're too simple. They're too concise. They're, they don't encompass enough of, of what you're trying to achieve. So um, we're in the process of creating our vivid vision right now for our company uh, as CEO. I'm the one writing it. Uh, I that's, they really encourage you to do that, but I highly, highly recommend this guys. Like, and I have no like affiliation or anything. I've never met Cameron, but, um, he's got some really great YouTube videos too. Like he's been interviewed by a lot of big names and, and, uh, about this. And so I think, uh, it's worth checking out. Awesome. Thank you, Tate, for that great send out. And thank you for joining us on the foundry. Yes, sir. Love it.